Welcome back to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato, here with my co-conspirator, Scott Bernstein. Hey now. And uh, thanks for listening. Please follow us on social media. Check out our YouTube channel that's up. And we're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, we're pretty excited for today's episode. We get a lot of requests, and we appreciate your feedback. People asking us to have more episodes on what's going on in Philadelphia. And uh, very interesting crime family, interesting history. What's going on now is pretty interesting. And if you know uh, my uh, intrepid colleague, Scott Bernstein, he reports on Philadelphia a lot. He wrote a great book about Philadelphia, uh, Mafia Prince. With, uh, he co-wrote that with Crazy Phil Leonetti. Yes, sir. Um, I'm, so, I'm forever indebted to Mr. Leonetti and George Anastasia. It's, great. it's a great book. For... Uh, allowing me to kind of make my bones as yeah. a Philadelphia reporter and from someone that's not from Philadelphia. Right. Um, and uh, I don't think I would feel comfortable delving in or diving into the deep end of the pool as I have the last seven, six, seven, eight years. Uh, if I, if I didn't have that co-signing from, uh, Phil and, and George who gave me access to Phil. And, and from the comments I see, at least for our podcast, people in Philly also say like, they consider that you have street cred, even if you're not a Philly guy, like the, the people in Philly, like your reporting, even though, even though you're, well, I know that the Detroit. crime family I'm required reading for a lot of those guys. <laughs> and I don't know if a lot of those guys like me. In no. fact, I've heard <laughs> quite a few of them, not. uh, are, are upset with some of my reporting. But uh, I think they're just upset because I filled a void and um, Philadelphia and the Philadelphia Mafia has always been chronicled by multiple media outlets over the years. And there was a, a downtick um, in the 2010s, a lot of it having to do with cutbacks in the newspaper industry because the newspaper industry has been turned upside down and resources have been depleted and organized crime, the organized crime beats that a, a lot of big newspapers have gone by the wayside. So there was a, a, a vacuum um, that needed to be filled, a void that needed to be filled about you know, reporting on the day-to-day -day machinations of what's going on with that crime family. And George had kind of lost no, and interest. It, well, I'm saying George, point. George doesn't write about them right. uh, on a regular basis anymore. Right. And if George was writing about them on a regular basis, I probably wouldn't be reporting as much as I do. Yeah, and he was pretty open about how he was losing interest and yeah. he wanted to write about different things. And um, well, and if you, I just get kind of macro here before we get into the micro topic of today's episode, but. One thing that's interesting to me about Philly, and you see in other places like Detroit, uh, especially New York, Boston, but there's this like rich tapestry of yeah. like, you've got an active LCN family, you've got this rich history of African American organized crime in that history. You've got the pagans, the bikers, wh like, which are they're like the front meth, page, the meth trade, right? The meth trade. You had Junior some, Black uh, Mafia. You had like an Irish crew Black there. Brother, at one point. Black Brothers Inc. The I K love that. that that's the K and A, case the study. K and A gang, which was the Irish Mafia. Right. The Tenth and O gang, which is the, um, it's this kind of semi independent. Uh, breeding ground for mobsters, and then also for independent. Uh, wise guys that don't necessarily join the mafia, but are right. mafia adjacent. And then my favorite case study in that area is South Jersey, which we've talked about with Frank Panessa, the Cherry Hill Gambinos. You had Sicilians down there who were affiliated with the with New York, with the Gambino crime family. So it's just, uh, and you have Atlantic City, you have South Jersey, you have Philly. It's just, it's just, it's just a really interesting case study regionally overall well and, so, and to me it's i like it's, talking about it it's the most compelling crime family to study and to report on um i, I don't even think it, it's a debate i don't even think there's anyone that is in the in the same stratosphere as philadelphia in terms of the um <laughs> the fascinating intriguing um compelling nature of studying these guys they are unlike any other crime family in the history of uh, mob crime families especially this group the last 30 years uh i call them the instagram mob yeah i call joey merlino the instagram don they're pretty public these are guys other... that are the guys that are running the crime family and have been running the crime family again it it they're outliers they are a group of high school 
elementary school, junior high school, sandlot buddies that grew up on street corners of South Philly in the late 70s and early 80s. And they took power in the Philadelphia mob in their early 30s, late 20s. And now by they're forced, took it by, by force. force. They, they won a, a shooting war in the 1990s uh, against a, a Sicilian mafia don named John Stampha and took power when they were about 30, 31, 32 years old. And it's been 30 years. They're all pushing 60 now. And you would think that a group of guys like that, that are closer to collecting social security than <laughs> going to their high school graduation parties, wouldn't care about being cool. But that's all these guys care about. Yeah. Cool is a commodity in the Philadelphia Mafia. It has been for three decades, and it it, it weaves its way into the into the politics of of the uh, of the Bruno Scarfo crime family, and how power uh, flows uh, vertically and horizontally, and makes for just a soap opera. Uh, uh, an underworld soap opera that is like I, I keep on saying this is unparalleled. Yeah, and it, yeah, they are pretty chic. At least, at least most of the guys—they're all fashionistas, right? As, as opposed to they like, um, you know, we we were talking with our producer Ben earlier about uh, the Sopranos, and you think of like Junior Soprano. So that's not what these these guys do not look like. Junior Soprano. No, even, these aren't like the old guys with their moldies. Remember Christopher? But even Christopher, Mal, but even Christopher Montesante <laughs> and the younger generation wise guys in the Sopranos were dressing uh, in their dress was inspired by the older guys that they were being mentored by. Yeah. Right. Now there was a, a definitive, and we're talking about underworld fashion now, but there was a, a definitive shift in underworld fashion, at least when it comes to the Italian mafia in the 1980s, right. where everyone went from wearing suits and ties to in track the 80s suits. and 90s, <laughs> track suits became more of the day to day yeah. uh, fashion trends. Yeah. And, uh, but that's not what the Philly guys have done. The Philly guys do not wear it necessarily. They're, they're not tracksuit guys no. and they're not jacket and tie guys. Right. They're like, uh, you know, cutting edge fashion week in Paris skinny type jeans. guys. <laughs> no, seriously, skinny yeah, jeans know. and cargo I pants I and in fitted polos yeah. in, in lots of uh, wild uh, yeah. pastel colors. Yeah. They're always like real tan and like yeah. uh, good hair, like the, pretty like suave. And, and they're, you know, I call them the Instagram <laughs> Mafia, because a lot of these guys are on social media and they're sharing their locations and they're sharing who they're partying with and where they're partying. And and uh, I've said for now 10 years, it, it hasn't happened yet, but I've said for the last 10 years that all these photos that we've seen um, being distributed over social media are eventually going to end up in a racketeering case in front of a jury as evidence that these guys are a, a criminal organization, not just a bunch of buddies hanging out every night. Yeah. Um, but it hasn't bit them yet. Yeah. Uh, these guys all went to prison uh, in the early 2000s for a, a big racketeering case after they had taken the mob in Philly over by force with a sh winning a shooting war. Uh, they were all brought in front of the uh, in front of a jury um you know, in, in the half decade or so after they took power, uh, they were charged with a slew of murders and a bunch of racketeering counts. They beat all the murder counts, but were convicted on the racketeering charges. They all went and did anywhere between six, seven years and 10, 11 years in prison. They were all out of prison by the 2010s. And now they're all, they've all been back on the scene for a decade. Um, and what we're going to talk about today is that the most recent, um, Law, law enforcement assault on the Bruno Scarfo crime family has been resolved. Um, there was a pretty significant November 2020 racketeering bust that uh, included uh, gambling, loan sharking, extortion, drugs that hit a number of made members of the Bruno Scarfo clan, including two very powerful members, uh, the underboss, uh, handsome Stevie Mazzone, Stephen Mazzoni, who they call Handsome Stevie, and Stevie's nephew via marriage, who everyone is touting as the future of the Philadelphia mob, the up and coming superstar in Eastland gangland circles, Dominic Baby Dom Grande, also known as Teflon Dom. 
Yeah. But he's not Teflon anymore. No. Uh, both him and Stevie are on their way to prison. And I believe there was 15 co-defendants in this case that dropped 18 months ago. And Out of the 15, how many were made guys? There were more than just the two of them, right? At least five. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. And a giant part of this bust, we need to say off the top, um, comes from FBI recordings of a induction ceremony, mm -hmm. which had only been achieved really one other time in England? history where they bugged a New England uh, mafia making ceremony in 1989. But uh, this was in 2015, and uh, we're going to go over some of the transcripts right now. They have the entire making ceremony uh, recorded. Stephen Mazzone was one of the people that was overseeing the making ceremony. He not only gives a introduction speech to the, the new initiates, he also gives like a pep talk yeah. and uh, claims, or I shouldn't say claims, he uh, makes clear to them that first you know, all the money flows up, <laughs> you know, the, the, the money that, or he tells this to, to his, his new initiates, the money that you collect, the money that you make is not your money. It's our money. Mm -hmm. And we'll decide how much of that money you are able to, to walk away with. Well, that's the traditional way. It, right. Uh, money flows up. And from money time all, immemorial, yeah. This is a pyramid. Remember, Tony? Yeah. He talk, he does this, he's talking to his captain he, about well, the, it was the, I think it was the start of the second or third season. I think it was the start of the Where's third the fucking season. Money? And and Tony's giving a, a pep talk to his troops about the fact that they they're having a, a downturn in, in their <laughs> right. soprano family economy. And and don't he, blame it on nine eleven. <laughs> he tells him, "Don't blame it on nine And he and he turns to Silvio. He's like, "Time immemorial, only right. two businesses." Have been recession proof, right? This thing of ours, yeah, and Hollywood, yeah, and the entertainment <laughs> and the industry, entertainment industry. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Stevie uh, was caught on a bunch of wires. Uh, Dom was caught on a bunch of wires. Stevie's arrest and eventual conviction via a uh, guilty plea had nothing to do with drugs. I want to be very clear. Mazones did not. Mazones had nothing to do with drugs. Um, Dom's did. Right. And Dominic, uh, as we said, he's he's the the up and comer, the guy that everyone sees as the future boss of the Philadelphia mob. I, I don't think this is just a media speculation thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, he has been told by the mm -hmm. upper echelons of the Philadelphia mafia that he is being groomed. To take over that how crime family. How much younger is he than those guys? 10, he's younger years? than us. I mean, he's oh, four, he? he's forty two years old. Oh wow, okay. Um, so he's quite a bit, at least twenty he, years younger. He's than twenty years guys. younger than most of these guys. Yeah, okay. Uh, and his dad was well. He comes from a a, a mafia line, lineage in Philadelphia that goes back a long way. And his dad, uh, Salvatore Grande, who they all called John Wayne because he was a true mafia cowboy, uh, or Wayney. Wayne Grandi was one of the most lethal hitmen in the history of the East Coast Mafia. I won't. And just, he was one of Scarfo's guys. Yes, and I won't just say Philadelphia Mafia. Salvatore Grande was a lunatic mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, early to mid nineteen eighties. For Scarfo, did a lot of the big hits that Scarfo ordered. Um, went to prison. I don't believe he was in on a murder. He. I could be wrong, but went to prison. I don't believe he was serving a life sentence. And then in prison, got caught in a drug case and flipped. He's now in witness protection, but it has not affected. Yeah, that's that's an interesting dynamic yes, right there. Has not affected his son Dominic from very early on in his adult life, gravitating towards the Joey Merlinos and Stevie Mazzones of the world, and and you know being taken under their wing. And groomed. I mean, he was, from what I hear, um, he was able to show his merits in major work, not racketeering, muscle work, mm -hmm. uh, mur understand. murders. And I, I'm not speaking out of school here because the prosecutors in Philadelphia will tell you that they believe that Dom Grandi was the trigger man on the Gino DiPietro hit in, in 2012. 
Um, that was one of the more high profile LCN. It was the last last in a long time. Last mob murder in Philadelphia. Yeah, ten years ago, and uh, the the prosecutors and the FBI are convinced that Dom Grande was the shooter. Uh, he was not been arrested nor indicted, but his name came up in the trial of Anthony Nicodemo, who was convicted of that murder. Anthony, I know this gets confusing for people that don't know that world. There's a lot of names and a lot of connections. So you think I, he was the driver? You Anthony was... Nicodemo was the driver. Right. Anthony Nicodemo was Joey Merlino's protege before Dominic Grande. Nicodemo was Joey's protege in the 90s, was Joey's driver and bodyguard uh, as Joey ascended. Um, is he a, is he a lifer now? Is that what Nicodemo is serving 50 years, wow. 25 to 50. Wow. Uh, on the Gino DiPietro murder, which some people, and I, I tend to agree with them. Some people say it could have been the, the worst executed mob murder in the history of mob murders. Yeah. Because <clears throat> uh, Mr. Nicodemo was caught about 10 minutes after the mob murder in the car that he committed the mob murder in with the mob murder weapon in yeah. the car. Um, it was very brazen and, uh, Nicodemo got popped for it. Grande has only been mentioned, uh, in court documents and I believe in court, uh, I don't want, I don't know if it was testimony or if it was the opening argument in Nicodemo's trial where the prosecutors say that Dom Grande was the trigger man in this. And they have a picture of the trigger man. It's blurry. But it's a guy in a hooded sweatshirt that seems to fit the physical description of Dom Grande. Uh, Baby Dom and Anthony Nicodemo at that point in time in the late 2010s, and, or sorry, in the late 2000s, early 2010s, uh, Nicodemo and Grande were a tandem. You they weren't made yet at that point. No, they, uh, they Nicodemo weren't. was definitely made at oh, that point. Oh, he was? Okay. Uh, Nicodemo was made in the... Late 90s or early 2000s. What does that tell you about... Um, Grande, on the other hand, I believe we know for a fact, based on uh, court documents that came out from the 2011 indictment on Uncle Joe Legambi, who was the conciliary, there were uh, wiretaps that people are talking about Dom Grande's making I believe that was in 2010-ish. So what does that tell you about, in a qualitative sense, that they would assign something like that to someone who would execute it so poorly? Well, I, I, mean, I mean, they got their target. So, <laughs> that so was I, there's a lot, like, of, there's a lot of questions about The logistics how, of it. Well, I think there's a lot of questions about order of operations in that hit. Yeah, yeah, whether right. or not it was sanctioned. Oh, uh, oh yeah, that's right. Whether yeah. or not Gino Di Pietro... Um, just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time in the sense that he had, from what I've heard, had a bitter ongoing dispute with Anthony Nicodemo. Over um, a drug debt or something? What was it? No. Well, okay, we're going to go, we're going down a rabbit hole here. Yeah. But I'll, I'll just, we'll try to be quick with it. Uh, Gino Di Pietro got busted in a drug case um, in the mid uh, mid uh, mid two thousands, I think, or early two thousands, cooperated in that drug case, sent his cousin to prison on that drug case, uh, was out and about operating to some degree. Uh, it's not no one's certain if he was still doing illegal things after he had cooperated or not, but he was living uh, uh, in South Philly openly. Uh, I don't know if he didn't think that people knew he had cooperated or not. The guy that he cooperated on, his cousin, was one of the people that, I'm throwing out all these names. People are going to be really confused by this. Uh, his cousin found Johnny Gong's Casasanto dead. Johnny Gong's Casasanto was a rival of Joey Merlino's. Anthony Nicodemo is the top suspect in Johnny Gong's murder. <laughs> Gino DiPietro's cousin found Johnny Gong's dead. 
there's some belief that Gino Di Pietro has knowledge of the Johnny Kong's hit, mm. which if you believe what the government believes would implicate Anthony Nicodemus. So they wanted to silence him. But then there was also stories of Anthony Nicodemo and Gino Di Pietro getting into a uh, heated verbal altercation uh. in early fall of 2012 um, at a, at a uh, backdoor casino that Anthony Nicodemo ran and was trying to throw out uh, Di Pietro from the casino. And Di Pietro cursed Nicodemo, allegedly. And uh, so this said, could have said been a personal beef more so right. than. Right. So nobody knows for sure. Sanctioned by the organization. There's been, I've heard stuff that there was a meeting the night before Di Pietro was killed, or that there was, um, that Di Piet, or that Stevie Mazzone, Dom Grande, and Anthony Nicodemo were all in the same place the night before. Di Pietro got killed. Now, there are people that are saying that at that time when Mazzone, Nicodemo, and Grande were all in the same location, that they were, that part of that reason for them all being together the night before Di Pietro was killed was for them to get some type of final sign off mm. or sanctioning. Joey Merlino, who doesn't live in Philadelphia anymore, uh, has been living in Florida since he got since he got out of prison in 2011, made his first return back to Philadelphia in the weeks before Di Pietro got killed. So there are some people that speculate that Merlino put the informed. hit into motion. Oh, he when oh, he okay. came into town, Nicodemo needed Merlino's sign off. Again, this is all speculation, um, but Dom Grande fits kind of squarely into that speculation. Um, but he, he got caught in this racketeering case. Uh, they identified him as a capo. He's intercepted on wires talking about selling drugs and pressing uh, Oxycontin pills. And, I mean, we've heard this a million times on on wiretaps about a, a gangster that's dealing drugs that's warning other gangsters that are dealing drugs about what a hard pinch a drug pinch is, about how, like, it ain't a slap on the wrist and how you have to be careful. And the irony is that they're being recorded telling someone this. Yeah, where were, where the, were the those wiretaps already, for, the, for, for, both, for Grande? And, uh, well, a lot of them originated, the belief is that... Uh, Anthony Persiano, I, get all the, I, I don't like throwing all these names out because even though I can keep all this straight, I know that everybody that's listening to this is just lost in all these names. But well, Anthony Persiano is a member of the Philadelphia Mafia that was introduced into the family by Dom Grande that turned out to be wired up. I see. And Persiano was going around for a couple of years wired for sound, and Persiano was the person that recorded his own making ceremony. And just, by the way, some audience members have suggested, and I think it's a great idea that we have a website where with each episode, there's like some information about some of these guys so that they can keep it straight because it is confusing. And I would say that long term, that is something we would like to do, but uh, not to get into to bore people, but you know, right now very much, this is still a, a DIY operation. <laughs> so it gets down to resources and manpower. Like, like who's going to do that? I, I think that's a great idea, but uh, you know, who, who would manage that site and, and, and upload that kind of data. But uh, at some point we would like to do that because I agree with you. It, it does get, you know, confusing. With, with, with Dom Grandi though, I think where this all started 10 minutes ago <laughs> before I went down this rabbit hole was that Dom Grande, from what I've been told, from people that I believe uh, have firsthand knowledge of what, I, what, what they are telling me. The Dom Grande, although he might not have made his bones in the sense of shooting somebody like he might have in 2012 with Di Pietro, that 
Dom Grande in his early 20s was involved in some capacity in at least one murder conspiracy. Uh, so, you know, you can do the math on that as anyone that knows the, the roster of Philadelphia mob hits. There was a handful between 99 and 2005 or six. And Grande got his button in 10 or 11. Uh, he already had his button. If you, again, if you, like, oh, oh, sorry, <laughs> whoa, <laughs> I just hit the microphone. If you believe uh, uh, the government, um, he, he uh, had his button before the Di Pietro hit. If he took place, if he took part in the Di Pietro hit, and this, which the government this, believes. This information is in the affidavit. Where, where does this? What, what what information we're like the to? like the speculation that he's involved in these murder conspiracies? Well, the deep like I said, the Di Pietro hit. It's not speculation. It's been said in open court. In open court, okay. uh, that's the Di Pietro hit that took place in 2012. Right now, I've been told by people that I believe have firsthand knowledge that Grande ingratiated himself with the upper echelon of the Philadelphia mafia, the Joy Molinos and the Steam Zones of the world by taking part in murder conspiracies in the when he was in his 20s so it would have been the murders that occurred in Philadelphia between let's say 99 and 2005 so that's not documented that's just what you've getting from sources your that I've underworld sources right. or whatever yes so uh, and all of those murders that took place in the early 2000s Anthony Nicodemo is a suspect in. And those were so unsolved. Grande, so if Grande, they're all unsolved. So if, if Grande was Nicodemo's right hand in the late 2010s and early 2000s, God, horrible this, the late 2000s and early 2010s, and Nicodemo used him on a hit in 2012, you know, it shows that the, the bond between them, in my opinion, at least the trust factor, uh, probably goes back 10 years to when baby Dom was 20, 21, 22 years old. And again, what I was told was that he, he it doesn't mean that he was a trigger man. I'm not saying he was a trigger man. You got people have to understand the way that a mob murder takes place. There could be 12 people involved in the conspiracy. Only one person pulls the trigger. But if you were involved in the conspiracy, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound. Mm -hmm. So all of these hits that took place in the, in the early 2000s, Long John Martirano, uh, Johnny Gongs, um, Ronnie Turchi was 99. Uh, the Martirano, that, the, wh wh what was... Um... Well, what I'm saying is the Martirano hit, Long John Martirano, oh, no, OG, one of the old-time Philadelphia mobsters from the 60s and 70s, went to prison in the 80s. Came out of prison in the late nineties, early two thousands, and did not get in line with the Merlino that, that, crew. That's without, right. Okay, did not get in line with the Merlino crew. Who was talking? Uh, there was rumors that he wanted to go to war with them to take over what they had. Uh, so they they hit him in the afternoon. But there were again, you have, you have, people have to understand the meticulous. If you're if you're a good gangster, you're a good mobster. You're not just someone that's going off half cocked. The way a mob hit is planned, especially a, a mob hit that involves cars. You have multiple vehicles. You have crash cars. You have backup cars. You have people that are monitoring police radios. So that's why I, the DiPietro thing doesn't seem on brand. It's very, right. it's very, yes. I can't figure, I can't figure out what's up with that. So again, what I was told was that one of these jobs that, that is a, a non-trigger man job whether it be you're, 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 you're in a car, it's supposed to act as a blocker, whether it means that, you know, again, you're monitoring a police radio, you're calling someone to get someone to a certain location, a certain time. I was told that Dom Grande was involved in a Philadelphia mob conspiracy when he was very young, again, 21, 22 years old. And that would have been either Ronnie Turchi, um, Long John Moderano, uh, Marconi, I'm blanking on the guy's name, uh, Maniscalco, uh, um, and, uh, and Johnny Gongs, Casasanto. 
Moderano is a really intriguing case today. I know that that's goes back farther than what we're going to, you know, we're talking about today, but uh, really a pioneer in the crystal meth well, trade. And the, the, the alliance between the mafia, the bikers, yeah. And, yeah, he was and, and the blacks, pen. and the blacks in the yeah. drug trade. Yeah, and he was really ahead of his time. I mean, like, I, I think we've talked about this before, like, the way I joke about it is he he was he was a meth kingpin before meth was cool, right? <laughs> that's the way I, that's the way I put it. But um, so there's fifth. I know we're all over on this. Ep- we're all over the place in, in this episode. So this case hit November of 2020. Uh, as of last week, it has now been adjudicated. Uh, Dom Grande pled out last month. He's going to end up doing. I think he's he's an eight year sentence. He'll probably end up doing six years. He's never done time before. I think it's a pretty good deal for him. Um, he was looking at 20. And, uh, you know, Dom Grande, just like, you know, these guys are, these guys are just like a movie star or an athlete or a rapper. They're human beings. You know, they put their shoes on one foot at a time. You know, Dom Grande just got married, just had a kid. Uh, I'm sure the last thing he wants to do uh, at the end of the summer is turn himself into the federal Bureau of prisons and go away for the next six years. But you know, it's, it goes with the territory. Uh, Stevie Mazzone has done prison time before he pled out a couple weeks ago and was sentenced on Friday to five years. He'll probably do four of the five. And, um, this is his, his second time going to federal prison. He served nine years, uh, between, I believe between 2000 and 2009 uh, for the, for his racketeering case in the two thousands. And um, how old is he? Stevie Mazzone is 58. So most of the guys that are running the family right now are Joey Merlino contemporaries guys between the ages of 58 and 62. Was was Mazzone, what was his pedigree? Was he was Mazzone, his dad someone? I no. So I've I've never um I'm sure it wouldn't be hard to f- to find this out, but I've never uh deep dived Stevie enough to know where his family lineage leads. Um but he's been with that Merlino crew since day one. Um I don't believe Stevie's dad was a gangster, uh like Joey's dad or Georgie Borghese's uncle. Uh, a lot of these guys have, you know, fathers and grandfathers and great grandfathers that were mob guys. Yeah, they grew up in that. Stevie Mazzone didn't. Stevie Mazzone, though, was mentored by a South Philly mob guy under the Scarfo regime uh, named Louis DeLuca, who they called Louis Irish, and was one of the first murders uh, that the Merlino crew carried out in their climb up the food chain to become the bosses of the Philadelphia mafia. I, I don't believe Stevie was involved in murdering his mentor, but Stevie's crew. DeLuca was with Stan. He aligned with Stanfa. Is that why he got, uh, I don't know if he was aligning with Stanfa or simply refusing to get in line behind Merlino and, and uh, his camp. So uh, Stevie Mazzone, he was always kind of the number three or four guy. It was it was Joey and then Joey's best friend at that time, Mikey Chang, Mikey Changalini. And when Mikey Chang was killed in the summer of 93, Stevie Mazzone kind of uh, ascended up a, a, a notch or two in, in the Philadelphia mob pecking order because there was no longer uh, Mikey Chang. So Mikey Chang would have been the underboss if he was alive when Merlino took control of that family. That was the... Biggest target that Stanford took out, right? Wouldn't you was, say? Was, well, yeah, it was Mikey Chang. That was his biggest. Obviously, he lost the war, but but he did. That was the biggest guy he yeah, got. Yeah, and he wounded Merlino in that attack. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I remember the Merlino walking got, got, got Yeah, got hit in the butt. <laughs> yeah, I remember. Uh, but but uh, Mikey Chang died in his arms Yeah, that, that afternoon in uh, August of 93. And, it, it like, like, again, when we're talking about this family, it's it's... It's like it's Shakespearean. It's a soap opera. It's it's like Goodfellas and The Godfather and Jersey Shore and um, you know uh, New Jack City. You know, kind of all rolled off, rolled up into into one real life 
story. Well, they're they're extremely violent, more so than probably any other crime family in yeah. the country. I mean, and, maybe not the last ten years, but like between what well, that when, time when Bruno that, was killed in what seventy nine or 80, 80, 80. That, I mean, for like the next what thirty years, the next twenty five years, twenty uh, just just a lot of bodies. Dry. I mean, it just took a long time to stabilize. Yes, <laughs> that situation. And, and with what was going on in the nineties. With the Changalinis, again, more names to digest. Um, you, And this is as Shakespearean as it gets. You had three brothers that were all aligned with opposite factions. You yeah. had a dad who was in prison. Yeah. You had... That could be a movie. Yeah. You had a dad who was in prison. You had a middle brother that was in prison that was calling his older and his younger brother from prison saying, please pump the brakes. I will be home in a year, yeah. and I will sort this all out. Like, there's no need for you to kill each other. Yeah. Because this isn't good for anybody. This right. isn't good for me, the brother that's in prison. It ain't good for dad. One Jackie, brother was sided, with, sided with Joey, and one brother sided with Stamford, right? Right. And uh, they both were actively trying to kill each other. And they, one was killed and the other one was maimed where he's uh, dis disabled his whole life. That was Stanford's guy. Yeah. So, so Joey Chang. Is he still alive? Yeah, he's still alive. But he's, uh, as his brother Johnny Chang was caught on a wire saying, yeah, my brother Mikey's in a box and my other brother Joey can't walk and chew gum at the same time. Yeah. Because of the fact that he, he was, he was uh, shot, uh, you know, 15 times in a, in a, a early morning um, uh, luncheon, luncheonette diner attack. That's the one caught on surveillance? Caught on, yeah. The first mafia hit ever caught on videotape. Right. So, yeah. Uh, Stevie Mazzone, after uh, Mikey Chang was killed, took the space kind of that Mikey Chang had as Joey's second in charge. So, but if Mikey Chang had been alive a year later when that war was over with, I'm sure Mikey Chang, and some people say Mikey Chang would have been the boss. Joey would have been the underboss. Mm. Um, that Mikey Chang actually was more of the driving force in that war than Joey was. Wow. Uh, either way, Joey became the boss and Stevie became the underboss and Stevie's been the underboss uh, now, you know, going on um, 25, 30 years. So what, let me ask you about like, like what happens on the streets now, because you have, you have Joey, who's sort of this boss in sort of this absentee boss. You got the underboss going to prison. You got, you got one of the hotshot captains going to prison. What does that, what does that mean for the streets now? Is it, is it standard operating procedure? Or do they, they have enough guys well, on the street, enough, the, enough heat, enough muscle to, the act, keep things yeah, in yeah, order. Yeah. I mean, the Philadelphia family right now in 2022 is one of the healthier families in terms of numbers. Ironically, after what we just laid yeah. out for the yes. last 25 I mean, they, they years. Have, outside of, you know, take New York City and, and put it into the corner for a second. But if we're talking about families that aren't in New York City. Philadelphia has got at least 40 guys right now wow. that are, you know, 40 to 50 guys that are made and on the street. Wow. Um, and... and so that's a, that's a lot of guys. That is. For, have, yeah, have, I mean, have, I, I didn't have, realize that. And you have two separate factions, and then within one of those factions it is split. So it's really kind of three separate groups here. You have the Merlino group. You have, which is the uh, modern-day group. And then you have this, the, oh, no, the old she? Scarfo group, yeah. which were the guys that came up in the 80s that went to prison before... Merlino and his crew took over that all came out at the same time that Merlino and his crew were coming out. So you got Joey and his group. Then you got Phil Narducci and his group, which is allegedly aligned with the 10th and O guys. And then from that Scarfo group, you have two sub factions. You got the Narducci group and then you got the, the Pungitori group, Joey Punge and, and his guys. Um, which are more at this point, from what I understand, all uh, um, quasi legitimate real estate flip house flipping. Um, I've heard Joey Punge has made a lot of money since he got out of prison, legitimately um, in the real estate market. So they're n they're not as active in the in the streets. I just know that there are there are three separate factions in the Philadelphia Mafia right now. There are. Roughly 50, got 40 to 50 made guys that are on the street right now. 
Now, they're not all, you know, one big happy family. And I think they're, it's, it's a very unique structure right now. You know, the, the Joey group operates as one organization. But, uh, you know, if any money is coming from the Narducci camp or the Pungitor camp towards the Joey camp, it's because of Stevie. It ain't because of Joey. But Narducci can't stand Joey. Yeah, that's that's Stevie's the pol- Stevie's the politician. They call him handsome Stevie. If you've ever seen a picture of the guy, he's got, you know, he looks like a model. He looks like an actor. Very, very good looking guy. Um, a lot of swagger. Um tall, dark, and handsome. Right. A lot of swagger. And um it, he's very well liked across multiple uh cliques. Well, you need a guy like that to keep things functional. And buffer, and, and any buffers for any buffers because for Joe. And one of the you know traditional criminological definitions of of a mafia group is being able to have a, a monopoly. And so, if if you've got two crews of Italian American gangsters who are made guys who aren't kicking up to the boss, then you that's a real problem conceptually. Like whether or not this is like an existing but you have one, a, but, one, but, one but, family. But Detroit, you know? or so Detroit, man, Philadelphia is such an outlier. They're such a unicorn, and that's what I think. I think I started this conversation by saying that. I, but you have a family that's split into three different groups, and a boss that doesn't live in the city that his crime family. Uh, uh, resides yeah. in, yeah. So it's it's very very odd and unique. Although, like um, Ben's got our, our our producer has a uh, yeah yeah query. Go just, ahead. Just for context, how many made guys are in Detroit right now? So operating? in Detroit, you probably have twenty to twenty five made guys, if that. Chicago, I'm guessing you're at fifty. Um. Philadelphia, you're probably at forty to fifty, but again, it's they're 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 factioned off. New England probably has thirty, and that's between uh, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Maine, New Hampshire, uh, New Jersey. The DeCalvicantes probably have thirty, um, but other than that, there are no other crime families that. Or Buffalo probably has thirty. So probably anywhere, the modern day crime family that's active right now probably has anywhere between 25 and 75 guys if you're not in New York. Or Chicago. If you're in New York, most of the families have, uh, you know, in the triple figures. Still. Yeah. Made. Yeah. In New York right now, I think the the, the Genovese and uh, the Columbos, I believe, both have 200 made guys. Gee. Gambino, Lucchese, and um, uh, Gambino have like 100 to 150. Wait, where where do you think the high end ones are again? I think Genovese and Columbo's were the Colum- high. I thought Colombo was like, le- like or maybe okay, maybe I'm. I think Columbo's may- on the. Maybe I'm messing. They're maybe like 100 I'm, or less. At okay, this I point. could be. I could be turning it around. Genovese, I think, is Genovese the top is one. Genovese usually two, the, they have 200. Yeah, they're usually the beef have have the most, and the Gambino is usually right after them. Um, and the and the bananos are kind of they fluctuate. Well, because in New York right now, every family has between a hundred and two hundred. Yeah, yeah, I would say the, that's the the bigger families are pushing towards two hundred, maybe a little bit over, and the smaller families are under under one fifty to one hundred. Right. Which, by the way, and we we have an episode you can check this out if you haven't heard it yet on today's American Mafia families where we talk about this. But just for Ben um, or others asking, thinking about this. That's just made guys. That doesn't include associates, too. Right. So that, like, if you have like, Genovese, if you have two hundred made guys, that could be a thousand associates. Yeah. With, <laughs> in addition to, so that's a lot. But of- then you have other cities that used to have organizations like Milwaukee and St. Louis and Cleveland that might have made guys that are still alive that are living in those cities. But there's no organ. There's no organization, and the city might have. Four May guys, five May guys. Kansas City, I guess I'm guessing is is kind of in that middle ground where they're not really a family, but they're not inactive either. Yeah. I'm guessing that San, that Kansas City probably has five to ten made guys with a bunch of other associates, and they're like yeah. a a glorified crew, and, as Carmen but, Patazzi but the would way, say like, uh, in The Sopranos. Right, but official like uh, mafia protocol in like terms of politically is. 
another Borgata will still recognize Kansas City as as long as even just one guy is is alive as a made guy. Well, the boss, they, they the boss, and the, the boss and the underboss of Kansas City are recognized yeah, right. and identified. Yes, Johnny Joe Sorrentino right. and Las Vegas Pete Simone. Right. And they're guys that have been made for 30, 40 years. Yeah. So they would still be recognized. Now, how active they are, right, that's a different discussion. But they would still be recognized by another family right. as, uh, as legit, you know. Um, but um, Hold on. Ben wants to chime in. I, I know. I, I apologize. No, I no. Never that. apologize, just... Ben. You're the voice of the, of the everyman. Yeah. <laughs> you, keep I... us, you keep us tethered because I, I'm going off. I'm talking about 57 people with 57 <laughs> different nicknames. Not Everybody's must, just uh, swimming right now. Encyclopedia <laughs> yeah. and uh, mafia like uh, the great Scott Bernstein. But I was going to ask, um, a lot of these uh, made guys. Are some of them my age in the twenties? Are they all collecting Medicare right now? Uh, I would say that the majority of them are over 50, 60 years old. Where at here? It just across the oh. American mafia landscape. Um, yeah, I, I think not, New York you might I have some not, younger guys, but that's it. There might be some younger guys, but I would say if if you know. The majority of the made guys in America right now are over fifty. Are the books open? Set. In theory, yeah. Okay. Um, but also, and then maybe twenty percent are guys that are uh, under fifty. And and remember also, like another example of Philly being anomalous is um, traditionally, like if you say like, oh, all these guys are fifty or sixty, you know, if you're thinking from the perspective of a street gang or something, you're thinking, boy, these are these are a bunch of old fucks. But that's the way the mafia has always been designed. I mean, right. you don't like, reach your peak until you're eighty. That, no, you that, become boss at eighty. Right. I mean, like like a lot of guys in even in New York, even guys in their forties don't necessarily have their button yet. Like like that's the point. Is like it's it's the highest honor in that world that you can receive, and they don't just hand them out to every but even, Tom. But, Dick but look and at Harry. Dom, look at Dom Grandi right now. He's only forty two, and in that world. They call him baby yeah, Dom. Yeah, that's young. That's really young. No, that's really, for I that mean, world, that's really he's young. He's considered a baby. Joey Merlino took took over the crime family when he was 35. He was seven years younger than Dom is yeah, right now. And, that, and that's what I mean by, like, an outlier. Like, Or three, he might have even been 32. I think uh, uh, officially he was 35 by the time Ralph was out of the picture. But for, initially when he took over that family or was in the process of taking over that crime family, he was 32 years old. No, for, for, a, for a group of guys that were in their 20s and 30s to take over a whole crime family yeah. is really unprecedented. Right. And then to keep it for the last 30 years. Because anywhere else, especially in New York, but I would say almost anywhere else, they would have gotten rolled over. They would yeah. have, they would they would have been killed like i mean well just, they averted they averted a bunch of uh murder attempts there was a a plan in in 2001 that was being hatched that very easily could have gone off without a hitch if an indictment had enough of 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 smackdown in the spring of 2000 but you know uh Pete Caprio the 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 capo of Jersey had made arrangements with the five families to yeah. kill Joey was in prison at that point. His guy, his guys had not gone yet, but there had been a plan that was all blueprinted out. It was all ready to be done. Stevie Mazzone, Georgie Borghese, and Joe Legambi were all going to be killed. Pete Caprio was going to take charge of the Philadelphia Mafia from Newark. He had the blessing of the five families, and he was going to use Marty Angelina. I don't know if Marty Angelina knew that he was going to be used, because if he did, that shows that he was in on the conspiracy. And the plan was to use Marty Angelina, who was another one of these Joey loyalists, who would have been spared as a way, as, a, as an olive branch to the rest of the Joey loyalists. Whoever was left. Yeah, yeah. and Marty was going, to, uh, it was going to be the conciliary under this plan. So, I mean, these guys, yes, it's, there's a lot of luck that played into where they are right now. And Joey talks to people, uh, is famous for saying that he's got the devil on his shoulder, looking yeah. out for him. <laughs> he's the luckiest human being in the history of the mafia. This guy should be either in prison doing life for multiple murders that the, the FBI has tried to uh, nail him for, or should be dead. He's averted two dozen assassination attempts. Now, what do you say to what do you say to Roberto? You want to jump on the mic with us or no? He's Roberto's in if studio. I, if I hear something I like, I'll get it. Well, Roberto, I want to go over some of these wiretaps. We, we used to go to South Jersey when we were younger, and w when, in real time, and when, when the Merlino Stanford War was happening, I don't know if you remember that. We'd read in the newspapers, the Jersey newspapers. Um, these guys are for people that aren't from Philadelphia that are, that are 
uh, listening to this or watching this that, that might not have a point of reference, the press, even now, with, with the media not covering them as much as they did at one point, the mobsters in Philadelphia now, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago, probably 10 years from now, 20 years from now, are covered as if they're professional athletes. They're covered by the media as if they're the Phillies or yeah. the Eagles or the 76ers. Everybody in Philadelphia, even if you don't pay attention to the mafia, you know who Joey Merlino is, you know who Joe Legambi is, and you know who handsome Stevie Mazzone is. Yeah. And you probably know, if you're someone that's in their 20s right now, you, I'm pretty sure you know who Dom Grande is. So what do you say to the people that, that say there is no mafia in Philadelphia? Who says that? You know who says that. I mean, anyone who would <laughs> say that doesn't have so someone really a any, of the any, program, any, so I don't know if we want to. You know, it person. doesn't really have any basis for that. If, if you're someone that wants to believe neighborhood propaganda, if you're someone who lives in South Philly and is friends with these, are friends with a lot of these guys and these guys' relatives or these guys' brothers and sons and nephews, and they want to put out, just like we have here in Detroit, you know, from yeah. those from those the those prominent mob families that yeah. like to put out this narrative that yeah. uh, Jack Toko allegedly did time in prison. Right, right. <laughs> that these are all you know. You these can't all prove be- that. That's alleged. These are I, all I, benevolent <laughs> community leaders right. that nobody right. has any way to show where they get their income from. None of these guys work legitimate jobs, yeah. but they all drive $100,000 cars. Yeah. They all wear jewelry that costs about a half a million dollars on their yeah. wrist and on their neck when they go out. They yeah. all live in mansions and all uh, go back and forth from the Jersey Shore into Florida. None yeah. of them have real jobs. But so you, you, you do the math. They're being unfairly it, targeted by the media. Yeah. <laughs> put it this way, and I'll, I, I won't make any claims or anything. I'll just say this, that when I was a kid, and, and, and Jimmy can attest to this, was I'd go, I, I won't say where. My dad worked at a car dealership, okay? So, some, you know, when I was old enough to drive myself, I'd sometimes I'd go there to just, you know, I need something fixed on the car or something. You know, it was, a, it was in the body shop of the car dealership. My dad would be the only guy there with a three-piece suit, and gold right. jewelry, and diamonds. On. Yeah, he's the parts manager. So he, he was better dressed than the owner. But you, but you, but you literally have people, yeah. and there's someone that I know where I don't want to mention him, but we're both, uh, you know, talking about this person now that wants to sit there and try to make an argument that um, because they're told by people in South Philly that there's no mob. That means that there's no mop. Yeah. Um, and I did. And what I just, a great rhetoric. I mean, that's what you want. That's that. You know what I mean? Well, of course, you they're going to tell you there's you no want, mob. Yeah. You don't want John Gotti on the cover of yeah. the time, Newsweek or Time or whatever. You know, you, that's the traditional way is or, to be low key, not Philly. That's what but, screwed everything up. So you you tell me what Joey, you tell me in Florida right now, Joey Merlino, who, who, he doesn't have a job in Florida and he's driving a, um, a Bentley. <laughs> Uh, so you, you tell me h- how he's financing that. Is it, is it envelopes coming up from Philadelphia? You know, if I'm a Betty man, I'm guessing that, that everyone in Philadelphia is sending something to Joey Merlino down in Florida on a regular basis. He's a professional gambler. Right. right? Jackie. He's Jack probably Owen. really good at FanDuel. That's right. All. Yeah. That's so. what I'm saying. A professional gambler. <laughs> Fantasy he football. Is a profe- he is a professional man. gambler. This guy goes through $50,000 in a weekend. Yeah. So what what about the other propaganda from the same people that say that there's no mob in Philly that that to the extent there is which there isn't well, first of all, we, have wire, were, we have wiretaps <laughs> proving that there was a mafia induction ceremony 7 years ago yeah. that was coordinated oversaw and um Administrated Listen, by Scott, all of Joey Merlino's friends. If you believe the friends. FBI, I can't help you. Right. <laughs> but I want to. I want to. You know that that's what they'll say. Yeah. You, the families, because that's the same thing in Detroit. Like you, I want to go through some of these. Goddamn FBI! I want to go through some of these wiretaps. Can't believe them. All right, guys, which are just, go. which are just, which, which, <laughs> which are just gold. Before we wrap up, I want to go yeah. over some of these wiretaps. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Go yeah. Ahead. Yeah. Oh, we're we're getting close to wrapping up. So. um we know that you're not on the wiretaps. Don't worry, <laughs> Roberta. We know that uh, I don't have anything. <laughs> the acting boss or the street boss, I should say, the street boss, Mikey Lancelotti, was the um was the was the person that 
conducted the making ceremony. And he was assisted by Stevie Mazzone as the underboss and Joe Legambi as the conciliary. And it's, it's, um, it's interesting the way they speak. And there's a lot of common threads through many of these wiretap transcripts that have been made public since the case came down in 2020 uh, about them talking about Philadelphia being the only ball game in town. I mean, the Philadelphia mob being the only ball game in town. Hey, it's us and it's nobody else. And, and you're either with us or you're against us. Um, and th- again, this is clear as day. So this is transcripts of a guy being made. Yes. Wow. Now, do you know where this was taking place? Yeah. So the, the making ceremony took place at a residence in South Philadelphia, um, October 16, 2015. They then went and had a celebratory dinner uh, at one of their friends' restaurants, Angelo uh, Lutz's restaurant, Kinch Consigliere in Collinwood, New Jersey. And the, the person that was wired for sound, Anthony Persiano, w- uh, wore the wire at the making ceremony and then wore the wire at the, the celebration afterwards, which was a party that the administration threw for the new initiates. Can't they check for that shit? Like, like I mean, I don't want to sound uh, naive Do you mean here, if but- you're the Philadelphia mob, why are you inducting people that have clothes on? Yeah. No, like, no. Take I'm, their clothes. Like, look, no, they do that in New York. Yeah, that's what they I'm saying. They make you, like, you get made now in a bathrobe. That's what I'm saying. Or, or like, even just doing, like, uh, you know, like, when you watch, like, uh, yeah. You watch like uh, Sons of Anarchy. They make you strip. They make you strip down and put on a you know in your boxer shorts. Not wearing a wire. I mean, yeah. I know this is Hollywood, but even on Sons of Anarchy, every time they would have church, they would want have a wand. Yeah. And look for any kind of like electronic transmissions, like before they start talking business. So I'm just. It just seems like kind of reckless these days to just let these guys all. Well, come they in there. clearly believed that everybody that was. In on this, the stand-up guys could yeah. be trusted. Yeah, of course. Yeah, Anthony Persiano, who was the guy that was wearing the wire, he would he is he had already been made. He was made by the Lucchese's. This was his second making ceremony. So, if you're the Philadelphia mob, you feel like there's nobody that's out of the guys that we're bringing in right now. There's nobody more secure than Persiano. The Lucchese's must have vetted him when they made him five years ago. So, when you transfer families, you have to undergo another initiation. He did. I don't know if you what have are they, to. Re- renewing vows over here? Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, like, because it's in the, tra- I don't have it in front of me, but one of the transcripts that was released uh, was of them saying, hey, Anthony, we know that you've done this before, but you got to do it again for us. That's interesting because, you know, that happens. Transfers happen. Yeah. It's not common, but it does happen. Scarfo Jr., right. or Scarfo's son, right. transferred to the Lucchese. The, Lucchese. the other, uh, opposite direction. Yeah, but no, but he, he didn't transfer to Lucchese. He well, he did, but he got made by the Lucases. He wasn't made in Philadelphia. Oh, oh, really? Nicky oh, Jr. was not made. Oh, in okay. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Okay. Um, so Mikey Lance, who, and you, again, we're all over here. We're all over the place here. Uh, but you asked me, you know, is there a, a stable structure in place to keep the family going? Right, right. So Mikey Lance is, is has never been busted. Uh, you can again. You want to do the math on that? Uh, Mikey Lance has never been busted. He is the street boss, so he's still around. And then Joe Legambi is the conciliary, the elder statesman, um, who was acting boss for twenty years. So you have two guys that are very capable of of keeping uh, the crime family afloat. And then next year you have Legambi's former underboss Joe Mousy Mas- Massimino coming out of prison. So there's plenty of. Yeah. Guys who hold carry a lot of weight so, that are still uh, on the Mike, streets. Mike Lancelotti says, um, you'll get you'll get introduced to everybody, but I want to be clear, we're one family. This is the only flag around. This is it. This is Philly. That's it. And then he he turns it over to uh Legambi. He says, Joe, do you want to say anything? After he said that. And then Legambi, who's 82 years old and is the he's the elder statesman, the one that uh, really got the family back on track after all of that bloodshed in the 90s um he said uh we're all one family now no disputes no disputes should come from he said we're all in the family now we're all one no disputes should come between none of us and then stevie mazone says nobody can break this chain and then legambi says anybody comes between us it's on them we're all together one familia say it familia. And, then, and then everybody in unison says la familia um, and I, I know when, when, when Stevie Mazzone says nobody breaks this chain, 
I'm 99% sure these guys, when these, when this conversation is taking place, they're all holding hands. Um, that is a traditional way to start and end a making ceremony. Not every family does it, but it seems like the Philadelphia the guys way, do it. In Detroit, I know they do it, where you start uh, the guys that aren't being, or the guys that are not initiated yet stand outside the circle at the beginning and everyone holds hands. And then when the guys are initiated at the end, they're included into the circle and they all hold hands. And, and, and the, the, the hand that you hold is the bond that you were not supposed to break. Do they burn the saint and all that still? Well, they do the that in the, that's during the making ceremony. I'm yeah. talking about what? to start the making ceremony, like before anybody has their finger pricked and any saint card is burned, everyone in the room gets together and they get in a circle and hold hands and some type of Sicilian statement or prayer is, is given. And then, they hold the making ceremony. Then at the end of the making ceremony, before they go off and have their celebratory dinner, they all get into a circle again and hold hands. Now the guys that were initiated who weren't part of that circle to start are then included into the circle. So now you're, you've been made, you've been inducted. Now you can be a part of the chain. So uh, that's why he says, nobody break this chain. I'm 99% I'm sure when he's saying that all those guys are holding hands. It's a literal. So, uh, ben and Roberto, I um, was talking to someone who's um, intimately familiar with the Bonanno crime family, and uh, hopefully we'll have this person on our show soon. But um, he told me that because of the risk that the Bonanos don't even have the ceremony anymore. They, like they, they don't even go through the, the they just, they just tell you They just tell you that you're made now because exactly what I scott like, like it well you know what it reminds me remember phil remember what does he say in the soprano so he's like hey either, they don't even do it they don't even do it right anymore yeah they yeah, don't yeah, even, yeah. Right? he says they don't even do the and he's like look there's no he, sword on the table right right he goes he goes either this, <laughs> this either do it right or don't do it at yeah, all either this means something <laughs> I mean, or not. yeah you agree with that you know what i mean it, it, it's like when you know you had to start checking out your own groceries what the hell's going on here yeah yeah ridiculous. but the, i've the, he told me that the bananas <laughs> they don't they don't have the uh the ceremony anymore because they don't want because of what happened in New England and what happened in I in told Philly. you they're a glorified crew. <laughs> right. I want to I want to read one more transcript uh, and it's a transcript where Stevie Mazzone again is caught uh speaking very candidly and and I'm going to get what exactly he says but the gist of it is we're all gangsters and we know we're gangsters <laughs> and it's okay to be a gangster and no he, he literally says no sucker is going to take that from us. Um so, you know, he was very open. Except, except legitimate business like online gambling, <laughs> you know, everything else that's good, you know, that you can't shake down any, you know, small time. Right. Yeah. Anymore. Some of those guys have their hands in that, though, too. The the oh, so, the so-called legitimate. So um, and porn, online porn, they got their hands in. So they figure out ways to get. To get there, I'm, so, you know, as long as I don't have to pay for it anymore. So right. this, this is the, uh, this is the, 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 the snippet from the transcript where they tell Anthony Persiano that uh, I know you've been made before, but you got to do it again. And this is uh, Mike Lancelotti saying, Anthony, I know you went through this already. Okay, we got it, we, but we got to make it official with this family. You understand that? Um, he said that to uh, Persiano before he uh, pricked his finger, and then. Um, after the ceremony was completed, the five initiates became, uh, they tied, they t it's what, what I just described, there's an actual term for it. I'm looking at it. It's in the court document. It's called tying in. Mm. So you're not a part of that hand-holding circle to start the, the evening, but at the end of the evening, as they are. You're really taken with this uh, ceremony. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's fascinating to, no. Yeah, no, no it, it, I think it is fascinating. Chris. Yeah, that they actually hold hands. No, yeah. I know, but we've spent a lot of time talking about it. Oh, um, the, so I'm just telling you that it's in the transcript that there. It's called tying in, joining hands as one in a circle, and saying "La Familia in unison." Let, let me let me say, ask you something else that it's going to push your buttons. <laughs> so the the same people that say that there is no mafia in Philadelphia also say that the Philadelphia mafia even though it doesn't exist that they don't deal drugs right how would you respond to that yeah, they <laughs> all deal everyone deals drugs, <laughs> especially on the recent so this uh, is this was mazone ending the quote-unquote tie-in he said okay you got it no side deals none of that always remember to touch base got it good then okay let's go get something to eat 
<laughs> he was hungry. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, hold on. I'm going to find the one where um, he says we're gangsters. How long did the ceremony last in total? Do you know? Probably an hour. Probably an hour. Now, do they give the Code of Omerta? You can't mess with anybody's wives. Right. You can't you, hit a maid guy. You're, you're supposed to. Are I they, don't know are they, they listing do. that in this? Are they doing that in these modern day or uh, well, in this? Be, yeah. This family becomes in this more Philadelphia than your own initiation. Family. Yeah. Okay. If you yeah. listen to our episode we did with Michael Francis, he goes over the whole. He describes the whole thing, and it's it's what you're describing. It's the old school way. I, I but that's in New York back in the day. I, I don't know, you know. I, I don't know what Philly. Oh, here it is. Here it is. Now this they is, just send you an email. <laughs> this is text. good. This is this is uh, this was Stevie. Uh, and then another thing that was uh, very important to him in this pep talk was his desire to reclaim Atlantic City. Oh right, yeah, I and noticed he was, that. Uh, telling all the new initiates that we need to get a hold back on Atlantic City. We need to plant a new flag there. Um, that's what I want. That's what we have to get. That's what he says. Yeah, I, I thought that was really interesting in your reporting when I saw that. And then he says... Um, Which that goes back to Leonetti and Scarfo. That was their stronghold, right? right? Yes. Back in the day. They, well, the, the Philadelphia mob had control of Atlantic City from when they legalized gambling in the mid-'70s all the way to when Scarfo and Leonetti went down in the late 80s. Yeah. I mean, that was a huge cash cow for them. Uh, so... This is Stevie saying, um, I don't want nobody glomming on to our fucking shit. You know what I mean? You hear what I'm saying? We, we're still street guys. Let's face it. We're fucking gangsters. I'm not going to let some sucker take that. That was Stevie in 2015 talking to the troops, talking to the new troops. Um, and then this is Dom Grande then saying to some of these new initiates about getting back into Atlantic City. We've got our hooks in them now. They either pay or they get the fuck out. Uh, and then him talking about the drugs that he can move. He says, I can move thousands of them. You know, these kids sell them for 20 bucks a piece. He's talking about, uh, you know, Oxycontins. So do you think that, uh, like saying, like, we're not going to let suckers take it. Do you think that he's implying that talking about non-Italian gangsters that are like he's trying talking to get. About any, I think he's talking about anybody that's not made. I or see. not working for that organization. Getting into there, okay. That we control all vice. Yeah, that's interesting. That's pretty old school. Yeah, because you you look now, a lot of the families it's like live and let live. <laughs> like, I right. mean, Detroit. I mean, they, you know, that's it's real different now. I mean, you know, they, so, they pretty much coexist peacefully with all sorts of other organizations. So we've we've given you an update on uh, the Bruno Scarfo crime family in uh, Philadelphia. 15 indicted uh, in the 2020 case, 14 convicted. They're all heading to prison. The only one that wasn't indicted, or sorry, the only one that was not convicted was Kenny Arabia, who was who died before he was able to have his case adjudicated. He was one of Stevie's um, main enforcers, kind of like his, um, um, I think they call him a, I forgot the term they use, but it's a it's a soldier that only uh, that reports to an administrator. Oh yeah, he's he's not part of a crew, so he's not part of a crew, but he's right. like his official. Yeah, guy. I've heard of that happening sometimes. Yeah. yeah, so that was like Stevie's guy. Yeah, um, and, and Kenny Arabia died uh, natural causes, but everybody was convicted. Everyone's going to be reporting to prison in the next couple months. Um, Stevie, we'll see you in about four years. Dom, we'll see you in about six or seven. Uh, but like you said, that's not bad for that world. And, and the last thing I'll say is with Dom Grande, it, it sucks. You're 42 years old. You have a beautiful new wife and a beautiful brand new baby. And you got to go do six years or six, seven years in prison. But I'll tell you this, Dom Grande, if he, continues to keep his mouth shut and he isn't nailed by any of these potential murder cases that they could get him in while he's locked up. It's 2022. By 2030, the start of the next decade, Dom Grande will be a free man and most likely he will be the boss of the Philadelphia Mafia. He'll be the 
If not the godfather, he'll be the acting boss or the street boss. So six years for him, years, it's, 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 it's right. Pay. That's the price that you're paying you do that to become the next shot. Co- become yeah. the next shot. Yeah. Co- yeah. What's that? What's that? Who says that? <laughs> one of those. Well, I'll, yeah. I'll tell you. Stevie Mazzone can do four. <laughs> Stevie Mazzone could do four years standing on his head. That's nothing to Stevie. No, Mazzone. I would think so. Yeah. Now I'm, you're six. You're 58 years old. You don't want to go away for four years. Of course, but, nobody but, ever wants. Yeah. But Stevie Mazzone, that's easy time for him. He'll go into a federal prison. He'll be treated like a king. Yeah. And so will Dom Grande. But I think it's a little harder for someone like Grande, who's never done time before. He's in his early 40s. He has a brand new family. Stevie has grandkids now, I think, or is close to having grandkids now. Yeah. So uh, this was fun. I love talking about Philadelphia. Uh, we'll, we'll give you more updates, um, you know, if there's any breaking news that's coming out of Philly. <laughs> last, last, last thing I'll say, Joey Merlino is allegedly – Back in town this month, uh, he's been at the Jersey Shore the last couple of weekends. Oh, interesting. Should be making his uh, face seen in, in South Philly uh, sooner than later. Is he allowed to be in Philly as part of his, that, is that over now? He, wasn't that part of I don't of think his... you can ban anyone from a city or a state. I mean, they, I thought, I th- they do that in movies, I thought I guess. that was part of his probation when he got out of prison that he couldn't associate with. Well, you can't. Well, he's off paper now. Oh, he's off paper. Okay. So you can associate right. with anyone you want. Okay, right. Okay. But, you know, if you're on paper and you're and you're on parole in right. one city, you can't travel without permission. Yeah. It doesn't mean that once you're off paper, oh, okay. you can go anywhere you want. Okay, I didn't realize he was off paper. I, I mean, I remember chronology. there was a movie called Primal Fear, which I really, I love that movie, and uh, with Richard Gere, and they made some deal for for one of his clients where the, the client had to leave Chicago or something. I'm like, that doesn't happen. You can't kick someone out of a state or a city. Yeah. Uh, but I digress. Uh, but Joey is, is in the city of brotherly love this month. He's at the Jersey shore right now. Um, but he will be making his return uh, to Philly soon. And I'm sure the media will go crazy there as they always do. So for Jimmy Bucciolato and Ben um, on the other side of the glass, I'm Scott Bernstein. We'll see you next week on the OG podcast. Jimmy, you want to say anything? No. Thanks for listening. All right. We're out.